So today we cover one of my favorite sections of the whole class. It's semi-infinite solids. It may not seem like it's a favorite section of anything. It's very mathematical, but it's very applicable to your life. To your life. So what do we have? We have a material. It's like cutting the world in half where it goes on and on. And we're just going to do one-dimensional heat transfer, transient one-space dimension heat transfer in a semi-infinite solid. So the solid um, has a coordinate system, let's say x, running from 0 out to infinity. That's x. Let me just put it like this. And you can think of trying to plot temperature in the y-axis and uh, you think about the temperature initially throughout the semi-infinite material being Ti. So it's everywhere Ti. And then abruptly, you either expose it to a fluid, where you have a convection heat transfer, that's handled mathematically as one of the cases, or you subject it to an applied heat flux. Maybe let's say you hit it with a laser and you're trying to do something like that. Or you just mathematically make the temperature at the surface change just instantaneously. That may seem the least applicable, but it is quite applicable. So we'll take the temperature and abruptly change it to some surface temperature. Just at the surface, so what's going to happen? You're going to have the temperature throughout the domain start to change with time. And I'm sketching temperature profiles at increasing time. Sometimes we'll draw it like this. Increasing time. That's different profiles at different snapshots in time. All right. Well, we want to solve for the transient temperature distribution in that semi-infinite solid. So we start with a differential equation. The second derivative of temperature with respect to x squared equal to 1 over thermal diffusivity, the temp time derivative of temperature. What is that equation? Fourier's law. No, it's not Fourier's law. BO number. No, it's the heat diffusion equation or heat conduction equation. It's a statement of the conservation of energy. Please don't leave this class without that basic knowledge. Right? <laughs> okay. Then we have the temperature at any position x at time equal to zero is equal to Ti. What would I call that, a boundary condition or an initial condition? It's an initial condition. It's at time equal to zero at any position x. So that's an initial condition. How many initial conditions do I need? For a diff PDE, a partial differential equation, that's second order in space, but only first order in time. I only need one. That's exactly right. But how many boundary conditions do I need? Because it's second order in space. I need two boundary conditions. The first, maybe think about way far away. It's always going to stay, regardless of what time is, it's always going to stay Ti. As x goes off to infinity, it's like in the limit, way over there. And then another boundary condition is that the temperature at x equal to 0 at time greater than 0 equal to Ts. Well, some genius has already worked out this problem, already solved it. And truly, they're a genius. What they did was they said, PDEs are hard, ODEs are a lot easier. Can I convert the partial differential equation to an ordinary differential equation? How? Looking at that solution, each one of those red temperature profiles that I sketched looks similar to the other profile. It looks like they've just been stretched a little, stretched further, stretched further. They have the same general shape. So the, the way you convert it from a PDE to an ODE is introduce a similarity variable because the solutions are similar in shape. So the similarity variable is equal to eta 
equal to x divided by the square root of 4 alpha t. I didn't leave a lot of room for that, did I? Let me scoot that up. So I'll rewrite that. It's equal to x divided by the square root of 4 alpha t. Somebody might say, why don't you take the square root of 4 outside? You'll see that in different textbooks. It'll be x over 2 times the square root of alpha t. Why do you even have the 4 in there? Why don't you just do x over the square root of alpha t? That's just a, a scaling factor in there. Yeah, it just changes your equations a little bit, but the way, if you define it this way, you get a very neatly packaged solution. So what do we do is we transform the governing differential equation using that similarity variable, and the partial derivative becomes an ordinary derivative, and you get the second derivative with respect to the similarity variable equal to minus 2 times eta, the similarity variable, times the first derivative with respect to the similarity variable. How much work is involved in transforming that equation? A lot. And I don't have time. And it's actually worked out pretty well in this textbook. So I encourage you to struggle with that and transform variables. Just apply the principles of mathematics consistently, accurately, and you'll get it. We transform the initial condition, you'll get that the temperature as eta goes to infinity is equal to ti. Well, take a look at this one. This one you can see mathematically. What happens if I put time equal to zero? I'm sorry, as I let x goes off to infinity, if I let x go off to infinity, no, I had it right. If I let time be 0 in this equation, what happens to 1 over the square root of 0? Eta goes to infinity. Now the second one, you transform the second condition, the boundary condition, and you'll say that the temperature when eta goes off to infinity is equal to ti. Hey, that's the same. These two are the same, aren't they? They are. But it's just, they have to be almost, because you need fewer than three conditions. When I move from a PDE with one time derivative and two space derivatives, I needed three conditions. But when I move it to an ODE of only second order, I only have room for two conditions. So these collapse into one condition there. And then the last condition move it over and you find that the t, let me try to draw it, t at eta equal to zero is equal to ts. So take a look at it. You look at this equation, it's a ordinary differential equation. It's second order, but what's special about this term right here in that equation, that eta term? It makes it nonlinear. It's a beast. It's a challenge. But somebody's already worked out the solution. So what we'll do is we say, oh, the solution is that the temperature at any position or a function of eta minus Ts divided by T initial minus Ts is equal to E R F of eta. E R F? Error function. I would like to say it's my old friend, but I wouldn't call it my old friend, right? It's just an error function, another function, like the sine function, cosine function, hyperbolic functions. Uh, you have an error function. What's it defined as? Well, the error function, ERF, of eta is equal to 2 divided by the square root of pi. The integral from 0 to eta, that's where it's a function of eta, so actually it ends up being the upper limit of an integral of what? The exponential of minus u squared du. It looks like the Gaussian in probability and statistics, a normal distribution. 
bell-shaped type. But anyway, it's the integral of that from zero to eta. Well, um, what do I know about that function? Well, you can plot that function. The error function starts at zero. So we'll plot f here. This is uh, x, and we'll plot the function erf of x. You can put anything, feed anything to it, eta for this problem or x in general. So you go out, it starts at zero, you go out some distance, and before you know it, it's converging to one. Converges to one. All right. Somebody says, uh, now that I have solved for the temperature distribution, what I'd really like to do is use that temperature distribution to calculate the Q double prime at the surface, the heat flux at the surface. It's like, I know that I have this uh, pr problem where I mathematically just said the surface temperature abruptly changes and then is held constant to Ts, but what type of heat flux would be required in order to achieve that? Well, Q double prime at the surface would be given by Fourier's law minus K dt dx at the surface. I need to put a partial derivative with x at the surface. And you work out the math, it turns out to be K, the thermal conductivity, the temperature of the surface minus the temperature far away, the initial temperature, divided by the square root of pi alpha t. You look at that a little bit and you say, hmm, what is the flux at time zero in order to make that temperature abruptly change from Ti, the surface temperature, to Ts? Infinity. <laughs> but, so it's kind of a singular solution. You don't, it doesn't make sense at zero time. But as you move out in time, it's proportional to time to the minus one-half. So the flux will go down, 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 down. So it's proportional to t to the minus one-half. So we did plot that error function, and we're going to then exploit something about that error function in a second. How deep does the temperature profile penetrate into that semi-infinite material. So the semi-infinite material here, again, we'll just sketch the initial profile, then you abruptly change it, and it changes like this, right? And I'm asking, at, at this time, let's say this is T1 here, this is T2 here, this is T3 here, it has gone a distance, let's say X1 for T1, a distance X2 for T2, a distance x3 for t3. That's the depth of the thermal penetration. But the error function is just like the exponential function. Do you ever think it really gets all the way to 1? Nah, it gets asymptotically close and close to 1, just like the exponential e to the minus x gets closer and closer to 0, as it, but it never really gets there. But as an engineer, you say, well, what's close enough? How about 99%? So what you do is you think of uh, going from here to here, going from all the way to 100%. Let's say you go to 99%, 0.99. So you say the error function, when at some value of eta is equal to 0.99. Can I solve for that? Sure you can. It would be like going back here and saying at 0.99, 0.99, come across, and what is the eta, or x, to give us that error function is 0.99. It, it works out to be a 1.82-ish, 1.82 something. You can see it, the numeric values in the appendix of your textbook, B2 of, uh, of this textbook. Or you can go online and go to Wolfram Alpha or something and evaluate it. The, the value that I got from Wolfram, I don't know if I printed it, I'm looking for it right now, was 
two, one, three, eight, six, blah, blah, blah. It, I mean, Wolfram gives you more digits than you can use. How would we use that number? 1.8213, blah, blah, blah. Well, you'd say that the definition of eta was x divided by the square root of 4 alpha t, right? Um, and so the eta that gives us 0.99 is 1.8214. So the depth at which the thermal information has penetrated is equal to 1.8214 times the square root of 4 alpha t. Well, pull that square root of 4 out, multiply that by 2, and you get about 3.6 something times the square root of alpha t. So it grows as it's proportional to time to the one half power. It grows more rapidly early, and then it doesn't grow as deep as fast as it goes deeper and deeper into the material. You say, this is not very applicable. Oh, no, we can really exploit this. And I'm going to mention something now that's not in this chapter, but we'll, we'll use it in the next chapter when we study fluids, fluid mechanics. Okay. So if we say, uh, if I have a, a, a surf semi-infinite fluid, okay, usually we draw it this way, and it's all at rest. And uh, the bottom plate of the fluid is right here, and somehow I'm able to, at an instant, just like we change the surface temperature at an instant, I'm going to change the velocity of the bottom plate that's in contact with the fluid to go from at rest, zero speed, to some u naught. Boom. Just like it went from t Ti to Ts at the surface of the semi-infinite solid for, for the fluids, I have the, the at rest fluid going from zero speed to u naught. So we think about plotting as a function of y, the velocity profile. Which velocity profile? The u in the x direction velocity profile. Well, here it is at, I'm going to just kind of sketch right here. That's I know that's the x direction as well as the u axis, and it looks like that. And a little later in time, it looks like that. And a little later in time, guess what? Mathematically, it's the same. Mathematically, it's the same problem with the same solution. All right? So what is the same uh, problem? Well, you go back to your fluids class which we will do, and you write down the Navier-Stokes equation in the x direction, and you get that the density times the rate of change of u with respect to time. I'm not going to write all the terms and then slash them, which are zero. I'm just going to write the surviving terms is equal to mu, the second derivative of the x component of the velocity, u, with respect to y. That's what survives. Okay, so let's divide this over. So we put mu over rho. What's that become? The derivative of u with respect to time. Actually, let's do it the other way. Let's do it this way. I'll make it look like we had the second derivative of u with respect to space squared. Leave that mu there. Is equal to 1 over nu, second, first derivative of u with respect to time hey, that looks like the exact temperature equation, the heat equation, the same form. Then we look at our um, two uh, conditions, one initial and two uh, boundary conditions. The initial condition was that you at uh, all space at time equal to zero is zero, it's at rest. And the boundary condition that u, as x goes off to infinity at all time, is equal to zero. 
and the other boundary condition at u at x equal to zero at all future time is abruptly changed to u naught. You have a similarity variable. The similarity variable is eta, which is not x divided by the square root of 4 alpha t. But guess what is instead of alpha? For thermal diffusivity, you have what is new in fluid mechanics. This, this, this term right here. It's a viscosity. Now I have a choice. Absolute or kinematic? Kinematic. That's exactly right. So the equation's the same. The solution is the same. And what happens is you're able to work out an equation for x, not thermal penetration, velocity penetration into the material. And that velocity penetration goes as 3.6. A lot of people will put another number on that. They'll put like 3.64. Okay, if you want to put a 4 there, fine. Put a 4 there. But they'll put the square root of nu t. So when, kind of remember these two equations in the similarity because when we get to fluids, we're going to say, here's a brand new parameter. It's called the Prandtl number. It's like the Reynolds number, the Nusselt number, the Grashoff number, the Rayleigh number. It's just another number. It's a Prandtl number, but it's dimensionless. And it's defined as nu over alpha. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a knife edge, sharp plate. We're going to have fluid flow toward it. And we're going to have the growth of a boundary layer. You're all yawning. You're saying, oh, professor, we studied that, that growth of that boundary layer, right? And then we're going to make, for this class, the plate hot. So not only are you going to have a velocity profile, and the thermal, we're going to have a thermal boundary layer as well as a velocity boundary layer. And then we're going to have the penetration. In some problems, you can have a very thin thermal penetration or thermal boundary layer and the velocity boundary layer much larger. Or you could have them grow about the same. Or you could have the thermal grow faster than the velocity or momentum. Which parameter do you think controls that and dictates it? The Prandtl number. The Prandtl number, the ratio of nu over alpha. So let's do it this way. Um, put, if I think about what we just worked out, we had a, a penetration of the velocity, you know, penetrating that depth, the velocity penetration depth. It's equal to, and we divide it by, well, it's 3.64 square root of nu t, right? We divide it by the depth of the penetration of the thermal information, 3.64 square root of alpha t. The 3.64s or the whatever the constant is cancels the square root of t. And what you pick up is nu over alpha square rooted. Oh, you get the Prandtl number to the one half power. Or the Prandtl number is equal to the penetration of the velocity divided by the penetration of the thermal boundary layer squared. So which case is which? If you have a large boundary layer, if you have a Prandtl number that's greater than one, then your, the thickness of the velocity as it penetrates, that's what the boundary layer is doing, penetrating into the fluid that's flowing over it, will be greater than the thickness of the thermal penetration or boundary layer thickness, just like that. This one, Prandtl number is about one. And for a lot of fluids like air, the Prandtl number is close to one. And this one is just the opposite, Prandtl number is small. All right. I want you to take your hands, a little physical exercise. Make sure that your fingers 
are not cold. Sometimes people have cold hands because they've been outside. Just make sure your fingers are about the same temperature as other parts of your body. And then I want you to touch a few things briefly. Touch, then pull off. Get your fingers back up to temperature. Touch, pull back off. And I then want you to make an observation of which object. You, you can find some metal on your desk your, where you're sitting, the metal. You could find some wood, probably. Or maybe a, be careful about touching the wood. I was going to say touch the underneath of the uh, table. That's more wood. But it's, uh, sometimes there's bubble gum. Yeah, you, you don't want to touch the seat, the, the cloth on the seat or the cloth on the back of the seat or something, touch the plastic, you know, keep, keep making sure you take your fingers back to the ambient temperature of your body. And then even you could touch the concrete uh, floor. It did tell me, do they all feel the same temperature? No. Which one feels cold or coldest? The metal. The metal does. Now, the wood in this room the fabric of the seat in this room, the concrete in this room, the metal in this room, are they all the same temperature? Yes, they are. So one is not lower temperature. It has the feeling of being colder. Is that a true sensation or some sort of false sensation that, that you're just faking out your body is not good at determining you know, how hot something is when you touch it? Yeah. No, it's a really good sensation. You know, your fingers have very good little temperature sensors in it because your body doesn't want to get burned. And so they send things to your brain that says quickly, if you're touching something hot, get away, pull off, ouch, right? That's a pretty fast response so you don't hurt yourself. So there's pretty good sensors in there. So when your fingers touch an object, here comes your warm finger, you basically have a little bit under some part of the skin something that detects the actual temperature and sends that information back. It's actually doing a pretty good job. So when you touch the metal, the skin on your finger is actually getting colder than when you touched the same temperature object, but it was the fabric or the plastic or the wood. Why? More heat transfer. It's better to transfer that heat out. And we built the mathematical tools to predict that and quantitatively answer it. So what happens when you take two semi-infinite objects and bring them together for a short period of time? It's your finger, semi-infinite, believe it or not. And that object, semi-infinite. If you take and find a thin piece of metal and you put your finger on it and you just let it sit there for a long time, does it still feel that it's cold? No, oh, it's basically gone beyond and some heat out of your hand has gone and increased the ter temperature of the solid. Hence, it's affected the temperature of the skin where you're sensing the temperature there. Okay, but if you have an object that's warm, let's say the object on the left is object A, and it's your finger, and we're going to draw a temperature this way, and it's coming in at uniform temperature, and to have object B, it's cooler, and so it's lower temperature here. Maybe you stay with the red color for temperature. When they're brought together, it could be that the surface temperature is close to A. Or it could be that the surface temperature is closer to the numeric value of B, to infinite material. See, this surface temperature, Ts, is closer to... TA initial, and in this case, the surface temperature is closer to TB initial. Well, how are we going to analyze this and then solve for it? Well, what you do is you put a very thin control volume at that interface. So you have conservation of energy for that very thin control volume, and what you have is you have the flow of heat or the heat flux out of A has to equal the instantaneous heat flux into B. Well, what is that equation for the heat flux? The heat flux was the thermal conductivity of A times the temperature at the surface minus the temperature A initial with the minus sign divided by the square root 
of pi alpha a t. And that's equal to k sub b, t surface minus t b initial, divided by the square root of pi alpha b t. See what we just did? Now the question is, does the surface temperature change with time if they're truly two semi-infinite materials put together? Or does the surface temperature stay constant after you brought them together? And the, the answer is, is it jumps to one surface temperature and stays that. It stays that value. So you can solve for the analytic uh, solution of the temperature of the surface and it's equal to the square root of k rho c of material A times the initial temperature of A plus the square root of k rho c of B times the initial temperature of B divided by square root k rho c of A plus the square root k rho c of B. And you may recognize it, that this is just the weighted average of those two semi-infinite initial temperatures. So this right here that I have in red, that may be 90%, and in blue, that may be 10%, but the sum of the two have to be 100%. It's just the weighted average, isn't it? So what happens when I touch uh, let's put B as the, let's put A as the finger, and B is either the metal, or the wood, or the carpet, or the cloth, okay? What happens? Can you see that the conductivity of B is such that it makes, for the metal, the, what's in blue, something like, I don't know, 95%. It pulls it to the B temperature. But the thermal properties, it's not just K only, it's K, rho, and C, uh, may shift it such that the carpet, when you're in contact with a carpet, it's much closer to your uh, temperature deep in the finger that hopefully was uniform temperature when you started. All right. I think this is pretty interesting because it's pretty applicable in our life, isn't it? Well, before I do that, let me do this. How many people have ever wanted a cold drink, gone to the freezer, reached in to get some ice cubes to put into your glass, into the tray of ice cubes, and brought them out and then tried to get those ice cubes off your fingers. Everybody, I think. What happened? Yep. So you have a little moisture. The, in, the, the two semi-infinite objects came into contact, the ice cube and your finger and the interface temperature fell below 32 degrees F or zero degrees C, and the water froze, and now they're attached. So what did you do? You just grabbed it and ripped it off? Yeah, you wait a little bit, put it under faucet or something else, maybe even blow on it to, to help, but you didn't rip it off. Now the question is, when you reached in and grabbed it, where it's like, okay, I'm going to do this really quick so that it doesn't stick to my finger, or did it happen fast? Fast. As soon as you touched it, the semi-infinite, that's when it's, it's the most accurate. That surface interface temperature jumps that fast to that temperature. Now, if you wait for a while, your fingers will then you know, win the battle, it'll melt a little bit of that ice, and then the semi-infinite approximation this, this is not valid any longer, okay? But it's valid immediately when you touch it, and for a short time period afterward. There's many other applications. How many people maybe uh, have hardwood floors or ceramic floors in their house, and then uh, maybe they'll have a throw rug because you get up in the middle of the night, you need to go to the bathroom, and it's cold, and you walk across that ceramic floor, and what about your feet? Semi-infinite, 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 semi-infinite. <laughs> it is cold, it's cold. Your feet are cold, true? So you put a throw rug down, 
the temperature of the throw rug is the same as the temperature of the concrete or the whatever floor, but the properties are such that your feet stay warmer. All right. Another application, uh, maybe up north. Uh, anybody have been a mechanic, work outside, you need to work on something, farm piece of equipment. I know that a lot of us don't do much of that anymore, but anybody ever have a glove? And you're working outside and it's everything's frozen. You have a metal tool laying there. Do you ever pick up that tool with your warm hand that's bare? <laughs> you're not going to enjoy that experience, are you? Because your hand will be stuck unless you have a glove on. Everybody works with gloves up there because it's going to freeze your fingers to that cold tool. Down here, I know it's not freezing, but it's, you burn it because you leave it out in the sun in August. Then you try and touch a tool, right? I've had that experience. Ow, that wrench is now very hot. But up north, also, some kids on playgrounds will get in trouble. They'll dare somebody to quickly kiss the, the pole or lick the pole with their tongue. So a metal type of uh, pole for the flagpole. And they say, oh, I'll do it really, really quick. I'll just throw my tongue on and get it off. Nope. That fast, that tongue is frozen. Now, they sit there and huff and puff <laughs> to get the tongue to, you know, to get away from the semi-infinite, to sort of melt and then release. But uh, I had a student in the class just like this. I shared this story and he shared with me. He got in a lot of trouble when he was in grade school living up north and he convinced a friend to do that. And they were stuck to that pole for quite a while teachers, principals, parents, and everybody was involved in a little discipline. <laughs> There's one last example I like to give. You're going to make a lot of money. And you're going to look in the rearview mirror and Donald Trump's billions are just going to be nothing. You're, you're going to make so much money. And then you're going to splurge in cars and other things. But one thing you should never splurge on, I'm going to tell you, is right here. Gold. Solid gold toilet seats. <laughs> do not, do not think that you're doing yourself a favor by getting a solid gold toilet seat. Because a good old oak toilet seat is well worth it. It's true. All right. So now we're done with that. Need to solve a problem, huh? Pardon? Is it? Yeah, no gold. Uh, so a secretary told me she took a trip to Japan, and uh, in the high-end places in Japan, she liked it. She said they had little electric heaters in the toilet seats. It was so nice. <laughs> you know, instead of sort of sitting on your hand fingers and trying to protect the uh, contact or reduce the contact area. <laughs> so uh, we don't have that big problem in S San Antonio that much, but up north I'm sure they do. But anyway, she was able to go online and buy an electrically heated toilet seat and install, her, install it in her house. So now let's solve this problem. We have a, a thick slab with a thermal diffusivity given, and we have a thermal conductivity of the material given. It's initially at a uniform temperature, and it's suddenly exposed to a fluid at 20 degrees and uh, the convection coefficient given. And then you're asked the question, what is the temperature at a depth of 0 0.050 meters after a certain time, 200 seconds? Well, this problem is, uh, I don't think I have the analytic solution to it, but it's, it, it's worked out in one of the long equations in the textbook and you're going to have the function of the similarity variable. You're going to have to compute the similarity variable, x divided by 2 square root of alpha t. And so for these properties, putting in the depth 0.050 of interest, putting in the thermal diffusivity, 6 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second, putting in the time of interest, 200 seconds, you calculate the similarity variable about 0.722. And then also, you want to compute another parameter that's in the solution, h divided by alpha t over k. It is a little mathematical when you have the convection boundary condition instead of that suddenly changed temperature boundary condition. And for this problem, you put in the 100, and then you put in the uh, square root of 6 times 10 to the minus 6 
put in the value 200, then put in k of oh, 110 on the convection coefficient, 110, and then the k of 19, right? All right, 0 0.20, close enough, okay? Now, what you do is go to a figure that has the complicated analytic solution implemented, and this is the eta, 0.722, come in right here, 0.722, come in with that other parameter, h divided by, or multiplied square root of alpha t over k, about 0.2, and then read off about 0.04, and so the temperature minus T initial divided by T infinity minus T initial is 0.04, so it'll be the temperature is equal to T infinity for this problem was 20 minus the initial temperature 75 times 0.04, uh, T initial is 75 about 73 degrees C. All right, well, we covered what I needed to cover in the semi-infinite solids. Uh, we're going to skip the object with constant surface temperatures or surface heat flux, just more mathematics. <coughs> Periodic heating, it's worth looking at, but next time we'll talk about finite difference methods for transient heat transfer problems. All right. Thank you for your attention.